This is the 48th video in a class on single agent search. In this video, we're going to summarize much of what we've learned in the previous videos, and this is going to serve as a wrap up lecture. And to point out that this uh, class, of course, has covered a lot of material about heuristic search in general, but there's still a lot of material that hasn't been covered. And so what we're going to do in this lecture is we're just going to give an overview of the problem that we were solving, we'll give an overview of some of the things that we've covered and looked at, and then we'll give an overview of some of the topics that we did not cover and the space where some of those algorithms or ideas uh, go in their, in their techniques. And we will use that to wrap up today. Um, and so let's go ahead and get started. So. Here we were looking, as I said, this is a class on single agent search. And this is as a general solving problem solving course. Our input is something like a graph, a heuristic, and a start state and a goal state. And the goal, so this is the input in the most general form and the output is a, a path from S to G. Now, this is the uh, most general version of the problem. There's actually many different variants of this problem and, and um, other things that we might consider. For instance, this graph that we have as input may only be an implicit graph instead of an ex explicit graph. Um, if I look at this problem, I just hand you the graph, the heuristic, the start and the goal. And we've looked at a lot of variants. For instance, maybe I give you the graph, but no heuristic. So how do I build a heuristic? Maybe I give you the graph implicitly. Uh, maybe I give you the graph ahead of time and allow you to do some pre-computation. And then I'm going to give you a whole bunch of start goal pairs. So there's many, many variants of this problem. And as we consider those variants of where I get this input, maybe the graph changes over time. Um, they're going to change the ways that we're going to solve these different problems. And uh, we might also be thinking about my output is a path, but it could be an optimal path. It could be a near optimal path. It could be any path. And uh, so again, those sorts of constraints will determine the type of solutions we find. And in general, in this class, being a general single agent search class, looking at it from the perspective of AI, uh, we've often made, but not always, made black box assumptions. That is, coming up with techniques that are general, that are going to work across a wide range of problems, and that will solve you know, not only one type of state space, but perhaps many type of state spaces. We're implicitly still optimizing the types of features we have in the test domains that we use. Um, however, in this course, we've tried to sort of cover this sort of very broad range of the types of techniques that can be used, and then started to look at, well, for instance, if I have a grid, what can I do given that I know that I have a grid? And how does that differ between knowing that I'm on a road network? Or how does that differ knowing that I'm in an exponentially growing problem that has you know, other features associated with it? And so if we look at just many of the things that were covered as an overview, uh, we talked about domains. So the high level, we looked at, for instance, the difference versus tree versus a graph search. With a tree search, I mean, I may, in an abstract way, actually have a tree, but maybe I'm going to take my graph and turn it into a tree using a tree search algorithm, as opposed to a graph search algorithm that is looking for duplicates. We looked at the difference between polynomial versus exponential. And so we see that the way that we built heuristics, oftentimes in polynomial domains, is different than in exponential domains and other things like that. And even looking at how we measure the size of a domain. Uh, so there's a lot of other things here. Uh, we looked at algorithms. If we looked at algorithms, we could think of things like a best first algorithm. These are things uh, in the most general sense would be like Dijkstra's algorithm is a best first algorithm. But some of the popular algorithms are things like A star, weighted A star, are some of the most common. We looked at things like how we could use a phi function as a generalization of weighted A star as a best first algorithm without doing node, expand, node re expansions. Okay, so that's an example of a best first algorithm. Uh, we looked at linear memory algorithms. 
linear memory, of, and uh, as their name implies, uh, generally are not going to keep an open list because they're going to only have linear memory in the depth of the current search. And so the most common algorithm that's known in the linear memory space is IDA star. But for instance, IDA star we've seen has given a more general version of IDA star called budgeted tree search. We also looked briefly at algorithms such as focal list algorithms. Focal list algorithms are related to best for search algorithms. Uh, however, they generally have uh, more open lists and they're not necessarily doing, well, they have maybe different multiple, different, different measures of best that the different algorithms are using. So examples would be explicit estimation search and dynamic potential search, among others, A star epsilon and things like that. And we also looked at other classes of algorithms. So for instance, uh, we could look at uh, budgeted graph search. Budgeted graph search in some ways is the best for search algorithm, but it has higher level controls on top of it that um, with higher level controls, then it, in some sense, it can deviate from what a, a pure best for search algorithm would do. We looked at bidirectional search algorithms, so something like near optimal bidirectional search. Uh, these are um, because we have multiple directions that we're searching, the notion of best first sort of in a single frontier uh, notion is a little bit different here. And we also looked at things like multi-agent pathfinding. Multi-agent pathfinding, we looked at algorithms like CBS, CBS, which combines together search over constraints and search as the best for search algorithm. So we have a very rich space of algorithms that are available to us. Uh, we looked at algorithm techniques, so we can these are general ideas that could be applied. So for instance, we look just very briefly how we can take something and make it go in parallel. So look at like, for instance, parallel IDA star. We looked at ideas like external memory. We looked at things like IBEX. Yeah, so external memory is looking at how we can use disk efficiently during the middle of our search. Uh, so if I'm doing a best first search and I'm keeping my data structures, how can we use DISC to improve that? IBEX is an iterative budgeted exponential search. And we see that uh, budgeted tree search and budgeted graph search are examples of this. It's a technique that allows us to balance the cost of re-expanding states and the cost of expanding new states in a general way. And there's many other general ideas that we see uh, as sort of general uh, techniques that we can put into our search algorithms. So for instance, um, other things like BPMX, which is, um, which is basically heuristic propagation. Okay. So we looked at general techniques that we can use that uh, are applicable to many different algorithms. Uh, you know, and they're not specific necessarily to a single one. And that gets us into things like heuristics. So for instance, we looked at um, where they come from. And here we saw that if we want to look at a heuristic for an exponential domain versus a polynomial domain, we might have we might be looking at different ways of building heuristics. Something that works in a polynomial domain won't necessarily work in an exponential domain. Something that works in an exponential domain won't necessarily work in a polynomial domain. Uh, and then, of course, how we build them. We looked at things like how to compress. And other things about using those in practice. Uh, we also looked at constraints, a little bit less than heuristics. But we looked at a number of aspects of, and so here I'm just going to sort of say examples. But we looked at quite a few, or a few examples of constraints, where they come from, and uh, how those constraints are used in search, and how they differ from the heuristics that we use in search. So for instance, we see constraints in something like CBS, but that's used very differently than constraints we see, for instance, added to a classical algorithm like A star. And um, yeah, so heuristics are just a, you know, get over here, heuristics are, are distances, distance estimates. 
where constraints are generally used to prune edges. And then we looked at quite a bit of theory as well. And so if we have theory, we can think about the theory of necessary expansions. We looked at this in A star at a very high level. Um, there's quite a, a level of detail we left out there uh, that it goes into the full detail of what necessary expansions are. We looked at the theory of bidirectional search. This is something that is uh, relatively recent in that the theoretical foundation for bidirectional search at this point is only a few years old. And it's related to, it is related to necessary expansions, but the theory for unidirectional and bidirectional algorithms is quite a bit different. We looked at um, suboptimal search. So for instance, we looked at the general conditions for suboptimal search to avoid re-expanding states. We looked at how we could compute the asymptotic branching factor to understand what the branching factor is for a state space, how we could analyze and compute that. We looked at the theory behind things like inconsistent heuristics, what they are, and what is the worst case performance if we have an inconsistent heuristic. And there's many, many other pieces that we looked at, some in varying uh, detail, uh, that come from the different algorithms that we have and their different performance. So we can see here um, that there are, there's lectures that cover most of these things and many of these in more detail. Uh, so for instance, another example that uh, we looked at is when we were looking at using a fee function as a generalized version of weighted A star is related to looking at inconsistent heuristics when we're thinking about re-expansions. So we see that re-expansions come both in the, in the case of inconsistent heuristics and they come from suboptimal search. And we have some uh, general algorithms that deal with the, with the cost of doing re-expansions in practice. So there's quite a bit here. And um, as we see, you know, we're, we're sitting uh, 48 lectures into, into this uh, course. And uh, yet beyond this, there's actually quite a bit that we haven't covered and that could be covered. And not only in the pieces that we've looked at here, is there quite a bit of detail that could have been looked at, um, like more detail we could have looked at, but there's also uh, quite a bit of a few other topics that we didn't really look at at all. And so I wanna just provide some pointers to um, some of these topics so that if you know someone comes along and says, you know, well, uh, I, I don't want to give the sense that like this is a complete overview because it's a graduate class. It's a complete overview of everything that's been done. Uh, there's there's quite a bit here that uh, that has not been done. So for instance, we could be looking at things like uh, real time environments. And so these might be environments with real time. We might be thinking about bounded computation. Or we also might be thinking about learning. So in, uh, in this type of domain, the idea is that, for instance, I have a self-driving car. I need to have a, a cycle that is, of, continue, of a control loop that is sending control commands to the car. And therefore, we have to integrate the idea of planning of what I want to do next, of acting, and maybe even learning. There's a risk that if I only plan and act, that I could end up in a cycle of acting forever, and therefore learning is something that I might want to do there. And so we see some older work, for instance, learning real-time A star would be an example that is real-time, has bounded computation, was used to solve a very large problem, so real-time A star is another variant. And there's been a lot of variants of these types of algorithms looking in robotics, uh, there's some great work that was recently done, uh, again, looking at the idea of self-driving cars and, uh, and thinking about sort of this framework of not just that I plan and then get a plan and I ha and then can follow that plan, but thinking about, um, you know, what happens if I'm acting and getting a plan at the same time. This is very similar to the problem that's faced in video games, but often there things are engineered so that we say, well, 
you know, I'm going to build, I'm going to build an abstraction, for instance, as was covered in the previous lecture and the previous video, uh, you know, I build an abstraction and I just engineer for all the worlds or all, that are created. I know that I can get, uh, do my planning in a certain uh, amount of time. And therefore, this is sort of, you know, engineered complexity, but in the more general problem, we may not be able to engineer that complexity. And so there's a lot of work that's gone on here, particularly in robotics as well. And so if you think about, you know, sending a rover to Mars, then we need it to be able to perhaps do some planning and uh, dynamic adaptation, which would be very different than, uh, than we might be when I'm, you know, I'm locally controlling something or something's in a more controlled environment. And so that gets us to uh, a second thing here, which would be the idea of data reuse. And so what if the world is changing? So uh, again, that may be that if I'm a, a, a Mars robot, that I have you know, some preliminary map of Mars, but until I actually drive around, then I don't know what's actually there. I don't know what the actual obstacles are. And what that leads to is this problem of, well, if the world changes just slightly, how do I reuse my data? How do I, uh, how do, I do some planning and, and do it in a way that's robust so that if the world changes, it's not gonna cost me or I'm able to take advantage of the work that I've put in already. And so um, one example of an algorithm that is very popular here is D-star light. Uh, D star was an original algorithm. D star light is a slightly simpler version of that algorithm. Uh, there's other algorithms like time bounded A star um, that are tr that, that are um, trying to get in that can be used in these types of environments. And um, but generally speaking, it's this idea of hey, I want to, if I'm doing some computation, what can I do to reuse that data? Uh, and for instance, I might think about um, if I do, I want a computer heuristic if I'm going to be solving some problems. And can I reuse that across multiple problems? Uh, we can get into other uh, more domains. So for the most part, the domains that we've covered so far are discrete domains, but we could think about planning and continuous domains. And so something like this would be, there's a number of different variants of this. Uh, one example would be any angle pathfinding. This is pathfinding that is typically done on a grid or very often done on a grid. There's, there's a set of algorithms that are done on a grid, but our uh, reachability is more generalized so that I don't, I, uh, although I can move from grid cell to grid cell, those grid cells don't have to be adjacent. So I can get quite a rich set of movement primitives. So algorithms like theta star are designed there, but we have more general planning algorithms like Anya and Polyanya that are able to handle um, any angle planning, uh, not only in grids, but Polyanya can handle it more in general polygons. And, and this is actually an issue that is faced very often is that uh, simplifying our world by discretizing it works very well. And so we oftentimes, even in the games industry, for instance, there's polygons, but they're not actually doing true, uh, true shortest path. They might be going uh, like I have to enter on an edge of a polygon and, and therefore I've discretized that polygon in some way. And so Polyanya is able to find shortest paths without that sort of discretization course at some cost. And there's a piece here which is important in continuous domains, particularly when we have weighted edges on it. The problem is going to get uh, quite a bit more difficult. And I'm just going to motivate this really quickly because it's an interesting problem here. So if imagine that I have a world here and I have uh, maybe some different types of terrain here in that world. And therefore, if I'm going to plan in this world, then I'm going to you know, have to sort of plan between the different types of terrain that I have. And it's been shown in general that when you have planning through different types of terrain like this, and we're not discretizing the world, then a shortest path actually looks something like Snell's law, where I'm going to follow a line here. And then basically, as I go into a region of different cost, I'm going to get some uh, change in the angle that I follow here. And then maybe I'll get some other change that goes through here. And so what happens is that actually in a world like this, 
If I want to reach the goal, basically, if I start at the start, I'm going to choose a heading. And as I choose a heading, that basically determines exactly where the final path is going to end up. And so you can think about, well, um, uh, if I that's going to give me a path in a particular place that it ends up in the world, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to essentially search over the initial heading that I follow that is going to get me to wherever my goal happens to be, if this is my goal up here. But the resolution that I need on this initial angle here, if you think over a large map, could actually be very, very, very precise. And so one of the things that makes this very difficult is that I need a very uh, high resolution and so the numerical precision that's required to actually find optimal paths here is quite high. And so that means the problem is no longer expected to no longer be in, in polynomial space. Uh, is, is not there because of the uh, because of the complexity of just even representing the angle that I need to follow here. So very interesting problem, but not something. And so something that something, for instance, GIS, they are very interested in these sort of algorithms because they'll use them there in a way that we wouldn't use in general problem solving from a sort of very, very general AI perspective. Uh, something else that we didn't cover in nearly as much detail as we could have is um, thing about transportation and road networks. Sorry. And there is a, um, there is a paper, it's on archive, but it's been published paper by Bast et al from 2015 that looks at the general problem of, or looks at the work that's been done for route planning and transportation networks. It has a huge survey of the different techniques that have been used there. And so I would uh, recommend this. So the title of that article is Route Planning and Transportation Networks. And that's really gonna cover uh, a, a, quite a broad range. In fact, just that one paper, really, you could teach a whole class on the techniques that are inside there. We've covered some of those ideas here, but not all of them and not in the detail that you could. So some examples of things that we didn't cover would be things like uh, hub labels. Hub labels are a really extraordinarily fast way of, uh, of doing pathfinding where every node is going to be labeled with a hub that that the, like, so between any two pair of states, we'll be able to compare the labels and find a, a overlapping label which contains the shortest path between those two states. Other things we didn't talk about, for instance, are dynamic costs. So if we look at contraction hierarchies, these have been very widely used in, in domains where, for instance, we have traffic. So it can be more expensive or less expensive and they're very adaptable to that. And you know, we didn't really talk about that. Or we did not talk about it at all in this course. Um, some other things, again, that we didn't cover are sort of optimizing. I'm going to put this under a category of optimizing the search time. And there's a few things under that. So for instance, what we can find here is there are suboptimal algorithms that are designed to say, you know, maybe I don't, maybe I want to get a solution as quickly as possible. So I'm not thinking about, I want a suboptimality bound, but I'm thinking about actually, how do I optimize my search to think very specifically about, I want the search to be done in a certain amount of time. So I even want to reason or meta, you know, some sort of meta reasoning about how I guide the search based on the expected time to complete the search. And Wheeler Rummel and his lab his uh, graduate students have done a lot of very interesting work in this area. Um, there's a lot of work in sort of these spaces where I have something that's expensive, like an expensive, I'll just say an expensive component. So for instance, maybe I have an edge cost that's expensive. I can get a cheap estimate, and then I have a real cost of the edge, which maybe is more expensive and is a, is a larger estimate. I might have multiple heuristics, so I have a cheap heuristic and an expensive heuristic. Um, this is we did uh, mention briefly. Uh, we have the idea of I have many successors, so maybe I can generate my close by successors or my inexpensive successors before my expensive successors. So these all this idea that have come with uh, something is expensive, generating successors, for instance, or storing the successors, and we want to optimize that search time. And so we could think about. Um, 
you know, how do I do that overall? I might have, for instance, algorithm selection. And there's things like dovetailing, where it's this idea that I have multiple algorithms where I might run them in parallel because I don't know which algorithm is going to work well. And so dovetailing is a way to uh, run, many, uh, run many of these in, in parallel. And we can also think about, um, uh, just if I sort of put a grab bag here. Actually, so I'm going to put under here others. Now, um, a big thing here is planning. So planning is this do is a domain that often uses heuristic search to solve problems. But as a domain, what's going on in planning is that they generally have a factored state representation. So you can, and, and not a, and a heuristic isn't provided. So I don't, um, I, I have a, some description and I can look at that description. I can reason about that description, but I don't have any other information about a state space. And, um, and so if I'm thinking about that, I may say, well, now I'm going to go compute a heuristic. How can I compute the heuristic? What are the different types of heuristics that I could compute? And so there's just, you know, again, that's a whole field. There's multiple classes that could be taught about the work that's being done in planning. And that's something that we just completely chose not to cover here. Um, there's a lot of work that's been done, and just to, to mention another area here, in parallel search and parallel algorithms. And we really, you know, although we mentioned some things like parallel IDA star, there is quite a bit that's been left unsaid about how to do parallel search. We could also think about very different problem domains. For instance, if I have dynamic edge costs. Or, um, or I just have uncertain edge costs. So for instance, we can design algorithms. There's a problem called the Canadian traveler problem, which is, you know, maybe I'm gonna to get to a road and the cost has gone up, or maybe it's gonna be more expensive. The idea being in Canada, the um, there's ice on the roads that's unpredictable in the winter time. But these types of problems are sort of more general problems that get out of the deterministic framework that we typically have, and that we've typically looked at in this class and get into different types of uncertainty. We've seen some of these, or I've mentioned some of these. Up here, we were looking at, for instance, uh, data reuse under a um, under a changing world, but there are some sort of different paradigms that looking at the types of dynamic, other types of dyna dynamic is or dynamic yeah, costs and other things in the state space that have changed. And so, even what I want to say here is, even when I talk about the work that's been done here, uh, sorry, the other thing I should just say is theory. There's a lot of other theory work that's been done that we just didn't get to in detail. Um, looking at, you know, looking at, for instance, in more detail, what is the impact of a heuristic during search? Um, theory that is looking at, uh, you know, the types of things that you can and can't do. And so, uh, as I said, we've left we've left a lot here, and even just some of the detail of the theories that have existed in practice. And so. Um, so here, I'm, I'm going to wrap things up, but basically I'm going to say that we've been able to cover a lot here. There's a lot of things that uh, are here, and there's a lot that is still left undone. And the way I want to complete this actually is to say that it's an advertisement for my lab. So I run a lab at the University of Alberta, and it's called the Moving AI Lab. And it's looking ab uh, about things that are moving, so we can there's a, a number of different ways we can interpret moving AI. One of them would be algorithms that about agents that move, uh, but uh, we can just think about uh, algorithms that get you know have a path that move you from one place to another. But we could also think about you know results that are moving uh, because they're so spectacular, or maybe an AI is able to do something um, in in a context that is um, that is surprising or that is meaningful. And so this moving AI lab. Uh, looks at heuristic search, and this single agent search class is just one component of the work that we do in the lab. We do work with games as well, and we do both with traditional games, but also with video games and looking at games companies and some of their needs. Of course, we've talked about some of that with pathfinding, but we've also looked at other things such as content generation and using search algorithms for that. Um, 
we looked at uh, so traditional games could be two player games could be games with imperfect information they could be games with more than two players um, but there's really a, a broad range of work there with at the broadest level a focus on search how can the common types of combinatorial search ideas that some of which have been presented in this class be used to build artificial intelligence that is able to solve problems that perhaps previously weren't able to be solved. And so if you're someone who has sat through this whole grad class or watched these lectures, found them interesting, or you're looking at doing study in this area, then I'm uh, always interested in getting uh, recruiting new graduate students that are highly talented and very interested in these sorts of topics into our research lab. And of course, you are always welcome to um, to contact me if you are interested in this material or have other questions about it. And so just, I will, many of these things, I'll, I should put this link, but um, our lab uh, is actually HTTPS here. Sorry, if we run that securely, is movingai.com. And through this course, we've had many different demos of the algorithms that we've developed or that other people have developed or that you know just general algorithms that we teach in the field so there's a lot of demos there there's videos that are available for download the research paper is published by the lab the current members of the lab are there as well as um yeah as, as well as other material benchmarks in particular so benchmark problems for 2d pathfinding for 3d pathfinding for multi-agent pathfinding and other things like that and so I would encourage you to go, if you haven't already, go take a look at our lab webpage. And um, hopefully you've enjoyed this course. You've learned a lot from the things that are available here. And, um, and I'm sure there will be updates that are posted here in the future. I know I'm continuing to update this website, continuing to put more information there. So with that, I will call this a wrap and, uh, and we will finish things off. So thank you for your time and I hope you learned and enjoyed everything that you um, received from, from attending this class.